retreat. I gotta get my enunciation. <coughs> okay, we are live. Does the chat room see us? Are we here? Are we there? Let's see. Let us see. Let us see. Oh, we are live according to the chat room. So it is time for us to start our show. Is everybody ready? Starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 718, recorded on Wednesday, April 24th, 2019. Inside Project Drawdown. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with growing genes, glowing gonopods, and solutions. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. You only live once. A phrase often accompanied by a decision to do something bold or indulgent or just short sighted, such as a tattoo that says, You only live once when the acronym YOLO would have has uh, sufficed and taken up a lot less space on your neck. But is that really true? <clears throat> Do we all live just once? Ask anyone with a neck, as anyone with a neck tattoo might tell you, no, it's not true. We live every day, which is each our own personal forever and only die once. But try encouraging your friends to do the bold, indulgent, or short-sighted thing by shouting, you only die once and you're likely to get a lot less takers. Humans have, for many generations, been treating the planet as if all that could possibly matter is that which is immediately mattering to them, as if humanity only lived once. To heck with the consequences. And now, the consequences are setting in like a YOLO neck tattoo at a job interview. Nothing against neck tattoos here, by the way, uh, but if you're going to get one, maybe don't base it on a meme. Just saying. The longevity. And so we current humans living at the current height of history's consequences have choices. We can make the changes needed to build a better <clears> future. <throat> or we can all get neck tattoos that say this week in science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the there's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the science that has been wondrously filling our cups, right? The science that is bringing us knowledge, understanding about the world. What is this amazing tool bringing us this week? Okay, I have stories about rare variants for height brains saying sentences and we have an interview on climate solutions that is sure to have an impact justin what do you have for us i've got uh, good news bad news why global warming is bad for baby penguins and uh, reindeer looking to the ocean to survive it as well as an ancient peruvian beer festival that lasted for 500 years <clears throat> wow was it called portland <laughs> Peruvian, not Portlandian. Oh, but. right. Portland yeah, then it would have CBD in it. Okay. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Uh, I have some perverse millipedes and some very clean mice. Perverse and clean. I like it. Let's take it to the show. Everyone, as we jump into the show, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to Twist, you can do that. That's right. We have a YouTube channel where you can subscribe. You can also subscribe to our podcast. We are available all places you find wonderful podcasts. You can also just visit twist.org for information. Okay, let's jump into 
our show right now. Right now, I would love to introduce our guest for the evening, Dr. Jonathan Foley. He's the executive director of Project Drawdown. He is a world-renowned environmental scientist, a sustainability expert, author, public speaker. His work is focused on understanding our changing planet and finding new solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and natural resources that we all depend on. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you for having me here today. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It is wonderful to get you on. So close to Earth Day. Did you celebrate this? I time? did. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of uh, like Christmas for environmental scientists, right? Uh, except we all have to work. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. Trying to get the 49th Earth Day uh, next year will be the big 5 0 for um, the Earth Day Festival. And uh, it was kind of cool. It was, it was founded in 1970 by uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson of the state of Wisconsin. And uh, I was really, really lucky to get to know him a little bit before he passed away and to get to know his family because uh, I, I, I was a professor at the University of Wisconsin and I held a, the first person to hold a Gaylord Nelson chair of environmental science there. And a uh, really amazing guy. Um, he was so wise and such a great leader and really thoughtful about big picture issues. Um, we could use a bit more of that today in our politicians, and he was an inspiration. So Earth Day is a big deal for me and for a lot of people I know. Yeah, so you worked in, in the research side of things for many years. How did you mm -hmm. end up making that step into uh, working now as executive director for this climate action organization? Um, and you've yeah. also you've also you also worked through the years to found different institutes within universities. How did how did that pro progression take place? Yeah, it's weird. Um, so, I mean, actually, well, I'll go way back. I mean, I I was one of those kids who wanted to be a scientist, like in utero. Basically, I knew I, every waking moment of my entire life, I knew I wanted to be a scientist of one kind or another. And I thought I wanted to be an astronomer actually as a kid. But then I went to college and started studying astronomy and physics. And I thought, you know given all the environmental issues we have, and I was always very touched and moved by the environment. I grew up in rural Maine near the ocean and the forest and the lakes. And I just kind of realized, you know, those other planets are great, but they're not going anywhere. Um, this planet's actually in crisis and maybe I should focus on that. So I switched uh, my graduate work to um, atmospheric science and oceanography, just kind of a little branch of physics, if you will and focus a lot on climate change. And I was a professor for about 20 years um, at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota. And along the way, I realized that traditional academic departments um, weren't really set up to address the problems we have. Uh, they were too focused on one narrow discipline. And you know, academics have disciplines, but the world has problems that transcend those and cut across those in lots of different ways. So there was a real need to kind of create new kinds of organizations that did science and social science and even humanities and the arts and bring them together. And more importantly, though, is not just connecting the bits of the ivory tower, but to build bridges out of it and into it, into the and out of the real world. So um, yeah, I set up a, a couple of centers focusing on like global sustainability and environmental issues. But along the way, I, I got more and more frustrated by traditional academia. I mean, I liked it. It's brilliant, lots of great people, but I felt like you know we needed to make our biggest difference out in the broader world, not just inside the ivory tower. Um, I think you can do both. Uh, so about six years ago, five years ago, I left academia um, and ended up running a museum in San Francisco, the California Academy of Sciences, and did that for four years, which was a lot of fun. Um, but I ended up finding most of my time was spent on like fundraising and kind of dealing with city politics and stuff, which is fine. And uh, so I was thinking now, like, what do I want to get back to? And so now I run a environmental science and education and advocacy NGO. So it's a little bit of all three things. We, we do our own science, but we also communicate it and do education. But we're also trying to influence the world to get moving on climate solutions. So it's kind of a nice culmination of things I care about, like, you know, doing science, sharing science and making it relevant and important to the world but focusing on a single issue of how do we fix climate change? And uh, that's what we're gonna do. I really hope so. I'm glad, I'm glad oh, we're gonna try. On it. We're <laughs> gonna try, we're, we're doing our part. There's only 7.4 billion other people and a bunch of trillions of dollars we have to work with, but uh, you know, um, but yeah, at least our little word is uh, focusing on that. But I think we're making a difference. We're making a little dent in this big problem. And um, I think together, if a lot of us do that, that's the only way the world changes anyway, is when lots of people try really hard at things that look impossible and they turn out not to be. Uh, think about, I mean, you know, 
a lot of people think, oh my God, climate change is impossible. How could we possibly change this? Like, you know, I bet a lot of you grew up the same way. I mean, I grew up believing so passionately that, or not passionately, but so convinced throughout my childhood that everything, you know, like that we would die in a nuclear war. We would always be at war with the Soviet Union, which doesn't mm -hmm. even exist today. Gay, gay marriage, that would never happen. Right. An African-American president, yeah. crazy talk, you know, stuff like that, legal pot, and you know, that's crazy, that'll never happen. Yeah. And everything we thought was not possible, not only was possible, they're inevitable. So I think it's only in the rear view mirror of history that we can really see how change happens. And uh, I hope that's the same thing with climate change. It may look impossible now. I'm like, yeah, tell that to apartheid, tell that to the Soviet Union, tell that to the Berlin Wall or you know, prohibitions on gay marriage. All of those things toppled and changed because people worked very hard at them. And uh, they probably yeah. weren't sure it was gonna work out, but they did. So let me ask then, because you're talking about these kind of big picture things that <clears throat> took a long time. Um, and, you yeah. know, I have my own experiences in, in just trying to teach climate change in classrooms for the past six years or so. I've seen the number of hands just raising when you go, who here has heard of climate change with kids of any age? That number has way increased. Do you think that you have seen in the amount of time that you've been working on this uh, kind of a, a real shift or, or movement of the needle in in your experience already? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the data support this too, and you know that very well. I'm sure you follow mm -hmm. this through Noki and other things. But um, yeah, um, there's only about seven percent of Americans today who, well, let's put it this way: basically, to round numbers, a hundred percent of Americans have heard about climate change. If you haven't heard about it already, you're not going to. I'm not going to bother with you. Um, of the 99.9% .9 of Americans who do know about climate change, um, only 7% of that actually think it's a hoax or it's not to be believed or it's all a bunch of hooey. And I think half of them are paid to think that. And, um, and you know, the others just have some cultural filter, which is no amount of science will ever change. That's just decided that, you know, they just don't want to believe this. I'm like, great. It's about the same number who think the earth is flat and whatever. Okay, great. You know, they could be my friends and neighbors, but we're just not going to talk about that. Um, but we got 93%, let's say, of a country to varying degrees believing and worrying about climate change. So I want to move on now. Like, hey, we believe. Now, what are we going to do? Um, so that's what Project Drawdown's about. It's like, we're not, nothing, we never go back and say, here's the physics of the greenhouse effect, and I'm going to imitate Al Gore and show CO2 <laughs> molecules. And so we've done that, been there. We're now saying, let's move on. And we start from day one, talk about, so what are we going to do? How can we solve the problem? And the good news is we actually have all the solutions we need already to solve the problem. There's more than enough to do it. There are more tools coming aboard every day. We just haven't bothered to do it. Um, we need changes in politics. We need changes in, in policy. We need changes in business practices. We need changes in capital and investment. And we need changes in our own behavior. But you do that and multiply it out over about 100 technical solutions, which we've reviewed and analyzed to death, the math works. We can, we can not only stop climate change, we can eventually reverse it. Not in our lifetime, but we can bring it back to a natural state and start today. And we can make sure we avoid the worst damages in the future. So it's um, kind of amazing. And that's where I want to focus our communication next. Is so yeah, we believe now, now what? What are we going to do about it? Yeah, so it's like, um, well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's like in the past, people would uh, debate whether smoking causes cancer. And now we're like, now we're going to help you quit. You know, now we're going to help you move on. It's one thing to talk about the problem and get people on board with it. Great. But unless you move to the solution, all you we've really done is talked. And that's a necessary first step. But I want to get to the second step is actually now let's move on to solutions. So how do you uh, and Project Drawdown assess these various so solutions? How have you come to the determination that these 100 solutions are the best things that we should be working on? Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to grab a prop. Hang on. <clears throat> awesome. <laughs> so um, Props. <laughs> hey, we, we have a prop. We have a book. Um, so this came out about a year and a half ago. It's a book simply called Drawdown, and it's edited by my predecessor, uh, Paul Hawken, who is the founder of Drawdown. And he's now going off doing some new projects, and I've come in to uh, kind of take the organization to the next stage. Um, but in this, they basically summarize the work of about 80 scientists who worked on this over the course of three years um, in different, uh, mostly there were like postdocs and grad students all over the world uh, contributing their time, helping to do this kind of review. What they did is, and it's so crazy, this had never happened before. 
Um, but these folks went through about 100 different solutions to climate change that have been proposed and used the same tools, the same kind of yardstick, if you will, to measure their financial uh, kind of dimension, like what would it cost, as well as the efficacy on reducing climate change, like how much carbon would it avoid going into the atmosphere? Believe it or not, nobody had ever done that before. It kind of speaks to how science can be great, but sometimes we get siloed. So the people working in electricity were doing their thing, using their kind of scenarios, their units, their kinds of models to estimate how would we affect climate change. But folks over here working on forests were doing something a little different. People working on transportation, yet another thing. So people were comparing apples to oranges, to kiwis, to grapefruits, to pomegranates or whatever. And Drydown was the first time anybody had tried to do it systematically across these solutions in a rigorous way that also kind of did a, um, what we call like a meta analysis of the literature where you kind of analyze the results of the results of all the different scientific studies. So we compiled thousands of different scientific studies and assessed them and looked at the spread of the results uh, to get a little understanding of the uncertainty, but also kind of what the averages were. Anyway, um, that was pretty cool. So that was an amazing body of kind of scientific work, but more importantly to that, and I think you all appreciate this, was it was written in a way you could understand. Like this, this crazy report on climate change solutions became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it's the best-selling climate book, I think, since Inconvenient Truth. And it's like, what? You know, how did a bunch of nerds write a book that became a bestseller? It's because, well, they made it accessible and readable. And um, Paul Hawken, who edited the book, uh, Catherine Wilkinson, and others who wrote huge sections of it, had a real gift for language and made it accessible and kind of inspiring. Uh, we talked about hope instead of fear. We talked about possibility and opportunity instead of doom and gloom. We focused on the, the solutions, not just the problem. And we showed where collaboration was necessary, not just conflict and more fighting. And so it kind of spoke to people's kind of technical desire to like, hey, can we do this? Like we were like, yeah, and here are the numbers. But more importantly, I think it became a symbol to people like, wow, hey, we can solve this. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, yeah, I bought 50 copies of this and gave it to all my friends at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really? Wow. And uh, they're sitting a lot of, I mean, um, well, there are countless companies, NGOs, and organizations I've been visiting lately where they said, oh yeah, everybody gets a copy of this on their first day at work. We give it to all the employees. I'm like, really? Wow. I had no idea. So it's been kind of cool. Uh, so it's, it's kind of when you do good science where you synthesize what we already knew and take it up a level, but then you spend an equal amount of time communicating it, you can have a really big impact. So I really, really think that's great. We're now redoing all the science behind all this. We're gonna actually be updating all the solutions annually from now on, right. but we're moving away from a, a purely book platform because books are great, but they're kind of expensive to put together. They take a long time to get out. They, you know, they get a little obsolete pretty quickly. So we're gonna be switching to all digital a lot more uh, social media, a lot more short form video, things like this. So um, stay tuned, Drawdown later this year, will be unveiling a lot of really new cool stuff and taking it out into the world. And is that part of your uh, the fellowship program? Yeah, we have a, a fellowship program where about every year or so we mm -hmm. announce a competition, well, not a competition, but like a, a, a selection process for Drawdown Research Fellows. And right now we have uh, about 20 research fellows working to update the individual solutions. And we have five senior fellows who kind of work year after year after year coordinating across the individual cohorts of fellows. And it's a really nice model. It's a little bit like, um, kind of like a graduate fellowship, if you will, but a short-term one. But mm -hmm. what's nice is people can feel like, hey, my work is contributing to a peer reviewed paper out here. Cool, some people want that, but hey, people are actually reading this stuff. I can send this to my mom. And she could read it, <laughs> you know, like that's kind of cool. You know, if your barber and your mom have heard about what you're doing, you know, you're onto something. That's pretty cool. So that is. Yeah, yeah. I um I, I I love all of these solutions. And we talk about new scientific discoveries all mm -hmm. the time. You know, we're constantly yep. bringing up, you know, new either technological advancements for solar panels or sustainable energy, or, you know, we're talking about aspects of climate change and things that are changing. But yep. I took a quiz this week that was on uh, CNN that was put together <laughs> yeah. through Project Drawdown. And, you know, I consider myself a fairly well-versed individual on, on these kinds of subjects. And I will have you know that I did it very poorly 
mm-hmm. on this quiz. And I'd, I'd love to find out, to talk about um, why some of the things that came up uh, as much more important came up that way. Um, so in this, in this quiz, you, you, you're supposed to rank various solutions. And yep. um, for instance, on the uh, food level, you're supposed to eat a plant-heavy diet. We talk about that all the time, that eating yeah. a plant-heavy diet is going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Yep. And that that well, is one of the biggest things that you can do. But that was not the number one. That's is not it the, the wonder. The, the is it the one. clean stoves? No. Nope. Throw away oh. food is food waste. One. Food waste. Well, on the food sector, it's number three overall of everything. What? So here's the funny thing. So you know what, Kiki, don't feel bad. Everybody <laughs> flunked this test. Um, and it was actually I very, failed. very hard. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm a type A. I can't fail. Come on. No, but everybody <laughs> fell. I mean, I run the organization and I got like a B plus practically. It was very hard. And um, uh, maybe we should have made it simpler. Like, you know, hey, um, just look at, you know, how much does food matter to climate change? To kind of get warm people up. That's probably the one feedback we got on this quiz is probably jump into the advanced, the AP level <laughs> class right away. Yeah. Um, and we should have kind of ramped up to it. But it kind of tells you how much we talk about the science of climate change. We often talk about the problems, but people actually don't know much about the solutions. That was kind of the point of this. Mm-hmm. For example, um, most folks, when they hear about climate change, suddenly, oh, right, uh, renewable energy. Mm-hmm. That's the solution. And then they jump to solar panels and windmills and stuff. I'm like, great. But you're actually now narrowed it to renewable electricity. And electricity on the planet generates about 25% of the climate problem. All the electricity generated on the planet from burning coal, oil, and gas is like 25% of climate change's contribution. Food, land use associated with food and all that is also 25%. They're, those two together, electricity and food, are half of climate change. And yet, how much attention does food get versus solar panels, and windmills, and batteries, and electric cars? Mm-hmm. Nothing. Nothing. So that would have been the first order, you know, question like, "Hey, does food, uh, is food bigger or equal to or less than electricity as a problem for climate change?" And ninety nine percent of people said, "Oh, it's much less." And we the answer is they're equal. Which I think is so funny because electricity is something that a lot of people don't have agency over where their electricity comes from, but Mm -hmm. everyone has some sort of agency over the food that they eat. That's right. Exactly. And and that's what's so really cool. A good point because um, different kinds of players like policymakers um, at the state level and at your public utility commissions, maybe your city, they really control a lot of the policy for your electrical grid. By the way, it's not Washington, D.C. either, but it's not you at home much Mm -hmm. except, you know, conserving electricity in your home. So we have a role to play, but you know, there's policy making, there's infrastructure, there's capital. It's kind of complicated. Food's the same way a little bit, but um, surely we can affect a lot of our food waste and what we decide to eat. That is, you know, there's nobody in Washington telling us what to eat. Uh, So why don't we, you know, that food has actually got a lot of, yeah, again, sense of agency to it. So if you want to tackle climate change, but it's about a quarter electricity, about a quarter of its food, a quarter of it's like industry and buildings and infrastructure, and a quarter is other stuff like transportation and chemicals and other things. So food and electricity are the two biggest ones, transportation, uh, a couple other you know weird little things people forget about, like, like making cement. When cement yeah. cures and makes concrete, it releases a huge amount of CO2. It has nothing to do with energy. It's just CO2 coming out of the chemistry of you know calcium carbonate. And um, that's kind of cool. It turns out if cement was a country, It'd be the third largest emitter of CO2 on the planet after China wow. and the United States. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Who knew I that? Knew it was food... big, that's pretty, that's pretty big. Yeah. Well, the same could be said for food waste uh, too. Food waste would also be number three in the world and, big, and then cement would be number four so, if those were countries. So I never understood the food waste thing though. Um, well, because it's, it's, isn't it then just food production at some point? Yeah. Because how do we get away from the food that we didn't eat? <laughs> Yeah, you're right. The logic here is that food waste, if you reduce the waste, you could then stem production. So what it's just implying, and that may not may or may not be completely true every time. Um, so food waste is basically the problem that we grow about, let's put it this way, 30 to 40% of all the food grown on the planet, not just in the United States, on the planet is never eaten. Uh, in rich countries, it's because we throw it away as a consumer or in our supermarkets and stores and restaurants. In poor countries, it's about the same number. 
And it's mostly because the farmer couldn't even get it to the marketplace yeah. because it rotted, spoiled. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or, you know, the train broke down or the truck never showed up or you got a flat tire or you, you don't have a cell phone. So you don't know when the, the truck's coming by to pick up your product or whatever. So that, that's a lot of work, too. And it's obviously um, a double tragedy. You lose the food and the poor farmer lost an income in a very tough part of the world. So we need to work on that, too. But anyway, the idea is if you can reduce food waste from you know, 30 to 40 percent down to like five or 10 percent. That, you know, that 30 to 40 percent means 30 to 40 percent of all the land used to grow food on the planet isn't necessary. 30 to 40 percent of all the deforestation caused by growing more food isn't necessary. Or fertilizers or water or chemicals or machines mm -hmm. and transportation, refrigeration, all of that. About 40 percent of it is completely wasted. It'd be like, mm. it'd be like you, I grew up in Maine. A uh, cold place in the winter. It'd be like, oh yeah, my house has a bigger furnace in it, but I forgot to close the front door and shut the windows. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like you know, waste is huge. Like you know, forty percent of the effort is never even used. Surely we can do something about that. So the biggest solutions to fixing the food system isn't local food or organic or whatever. Those are important too. But number one and number two by far are food waste and less meat, no matter how you grow it. Mm. Those two together are huge uh, factors in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and everything else from ag. And by the way, on agriculture too, a lot of people think um, the climate change emissions tied to agriculture and the food system are because of food miles, moving food around. Nope, that's almost insignificant. And actually Walmart can move food with lower carbon footprint a thousand miles compared to you moving it from the farmer's market to your home. Uh, because they do a huge volume. So I don't like that fact, by the way, but it's true. Oh, no, no, um, yeah. <clears throat> but neither one of them are that big. It turns out the big drivers of climate change from ag and food come from clearing rainforests to grow more food. Mm. That's number one. Number two is methane coming from cattle and rice fields. And number three is nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas people forget about. But it comes when we overuse fertilizers and uh, it combines in the soil and releases this very potent greenhouse gas out of the soil. Those three things are huge. Everything else, like chemicals used in ag, energy used in ag, food, moving food around, they're like a round off error compared to those big three. So it's deforestation, methane, and N2O. And people hear about methane. Um, oh, hey, since you guys love weird animal facts and stuff on here, I know you do. Um, remember, kids, uh, cows don't fart methane. They burp methane. It comes out the front end, not the back end, because uh, they're ruminants. They have to digest all that weird crap in their, their four stomachs with the rumen in there. And that incomplete digestion is burping methane out of their mouths. So when politicians talk about cow farts and climate change, they know nothing about climate change. They don't even know anything about cows. <laughs> you don't even know which end of the cow Burn. you're talking about. Yeah. Which and if they're from like cow? Wisconsin or Vermont, they should be voted out of office immediately because you, know, you got to know about cows. You <laughs> Come know. on, cow <laughs> Come on, cow people. Come on. Um, so, so you talked about cement a little bit, but something else that came up in that quiz was yep. refrigerants. And yes. refrigerants where I, I was convinced it was going to be cement production and I was making my votes for cement being bad and let's make it better. And it was bad, but more impact impactful to our atmosphere are refrigerants. That's true. It's number one of all the climate change solutions out of 100. It is the top climate solution is the gases used in the coils of air conditioners, refrigerators, and freezers. And nobody ever talks about it. Back in the 70s, we used to talk about chlorofluorocarbons, those nasty old CFCs mm -hmm. that were in refrigerants and aerosol cans. They're kind of miraculous chemicals, it turns out. Chemists love them. Engineers love them. But we found out that those chemicals leaked in the atmosphere and they destroyed the ozone layer. Oops, bad. Let's get rid of them. Montreal Protocol, we're phasing them out. Okay, we replaced them with hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs instead of CFCs. And they don't destroy the ozone layer, but guess what? CFCs and HFCs, anything with a fluorine atom in it, turns out is a really good absorber of infrared radiation, therefore a greenhouse gas. They're thousands of times more potent molecule for molecule than a CO2 molecule is. So they're kind of the forgotten greenhouse gases, but it turns out leaky uh, chlorofluorocarbons or hydrofluorocarbons, those gases leaking out of mainly air conditioning and cooling equipment coils are pound for pound the worst contributors to climate change by far. And uh, there are a lot of them kind of, you know, just dumped 
in landfills around the world. In fact, uh, uh, the other day I spoke at uh, Intuit, the company that makes like TurboTax and a bunch of accounting software. Nice company. Yeah, They're the here. Who just, who just put their taxes in are like, we know. Yeah, we, know. we all know those folks. Yeah, they're, and they're a good company. They're nice folks. They um, have a climate change program where they're trying to reduce their energy use. They're using renewable energy and all that. They've cut their carbon footprint down enormously as a company, but they have a little bit left. So they wanted to offset what was left and they were going to plant some trees, put up some solar panels on schools, good stuff. Yay. But then they read Drawdown and said, oh my God, refrigerants? So they worked with a team that sent uh, engineers and uh, community um, development experts to Ghana in West Africa and created a community-based project that helped local folks go recover air conditioning and freezer and refrigerator equipment in giant landfills in the slums around in the country of Ghana. And they went and recovered all of the gases out of those refrigerators and air conditioning. A lot of them were dumped by European countries or Israel or South Africa, kind of as the giant landfills just dumped everywhere. They went and recovered those gases and then destroyed them so they couldn't get into the atmosphere, preventing a lot of extra climate change for less money than it would, um, than it would cost to put up solar panels in Mountain View or something like that. So it's kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, um, a lot of people don't that, know about the book. Yeah, that's one thing that always drives me nuts too, because that is there's the easiest possible solution to avoid because if you go mm -hmm. six eight feet down it's 57 degrees all year round yeah. it's 57 degrees and the uh just 10 feet down or not even that far down under under your feet so mm -hmm. you could have an air moving tube system installed underneath every house like people used to drill wells for water you could yep. drill a cooling well in your backyard by going down and having a yep. pipe run through it and having it vent into your house like your normal air conditioner would. And you could cool it all year long without any of these gases. Um, well, that's right. I mean, actually, well, a lot of people are moving to these so-called heat pumps uh, and cooling pumps. They have um, ones that used to be geothermal, like you're saying, like people could bury coils in the ground yeah. under their homes. Open, up a, open up a skylight and uh, that, that heat in the house will rise up and it pulls all the air in. It's a, There's a zero energy solution to this. You don't but, even need to yeah. run fans. It's not going to well, work for everyone, though. Well, in a really cold place, you actually need the, basically you work on what's called the Carnot cycle. It's like they they would use a heat exchange mechanism. It's like an air conditioner run in reverse, mm -hmm. looking at the temperature gradient between your cold house and let's say Vermont in the winter and a fifty six degree you know soil below you. It may be fifty below outside, but it's fifty degrees in the soil. That mm -hmm. that enthalpy gradient, if you want to get nerdy, yeah. uh, is what drives the heat exchange. But then you can reverse it in the in the winter time, in the summertime, and use it like air conditioning. Yeah. But it turns out uh, Japanese companies like Mitsubishi and others have learned how to do this with incredibly efficient air based uh, heat exchanger systems. These called heat pumps uh, that can actually just do it from the outside air now. And so a lot of people are getting rid of like um, heating units that use natural gas and replacing them with electrical which in the 70s and 80s would have been a really bad idea, but today it's actually very efficient. And if your electricity is generated by solar and wind mm -hmm. to run that machinery, yeah. you can do it completely carbon-free. My, uh, my older brother um, has a completely carbon-free house in rural Maine. He runs completely off solar panels on his home, all the heating, everything, uh, everything. He's no gas at all, hot water, cooking, everything. And uh, it's kind of amazing. He's planning to then plug in his car next. And so, you know, you can do this. And it didn't cost much more money, really. It's you know, it's a pretty good deal. So it's yeah. um, it's within reach. We're getting closer. And there's uh, news out this week also that some researchers they published in Nature Communications on a new compound uh, that could potentially replace these HFCs and HCs that you're talking about. Ooh, a, I haven't seen this yet. Um, it's a solid compound that uh, is hmm. that they've developed that uh, is able to absorb the heat and uh and it works on compression and expansion and thermal changes through the fluid and all that but anyway uh brand new brand new and so the idea the hope is that it would be mm -hmm. easy to implement and not too expensive and that you know maybe not older systems but newer systems could be constructed that well, that's that's really cool. That uh, even um, some people are using just old-fashioned ammonia too as a cooling fluid. It's not as efficient, um, a heat, you know, from the thermodynamics of it. But it's like safe. It's there. We can use it. It's not a problem. 
And uh, but also just making sure, even if you use hydrofluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons, like or you know, don't let them leak into the atmosphere. Don't just dump them into the air. Um, so that's something that, you know. We could. There's a lot of. Um, as Justin was saying too, and I think about half of solving climate change is really like let's not do stupid stuff anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, we don't really need to. You know, how many people really need a big SUV? Really? You know, I mean, how many people really use those things? Um, do we have to use? Um, old incandescent light bulbs. I mean, basically you're using a toaster as a lighting source. It's heating a wire up to generate light. That's insane. We don't need that. We have LEDs now, we got better stuff. Yeah. Uh, even the internal combustion engine, do we really need that? Electric cars are vastly superior technology and they're getting, they'll be cheaper than gas cars within three years without any subsidies. Um, that's incredible. So, you know, we're getting better technology. We don't need to, and throwing away 40% of our food tearing yeah. down the Amazon to grow soybeans to ship to China to feed to pigs are like what I mean there's a lot of stuff that we do is like inefficient wasteful and kind of dumb and doesn't make our lives any better that is about a half of the part is to see being smarter being more and the other half is like let's be innovative you know like hey wow we can generate good things we need we I like electricity I think it's a great thing um, we're, we're having this conversation thanks to it I like, you know, um, hot water showers. I think they're wonderful. I don't want to have cold water. Oh, yeah. you know, the, goal, like, the, goal is never, yeah. the goal with the sustainability is never to give up anything. <laughs> right, right, right. To have all of it, well, but in a way that doesn't impact. And that's the thing is I think that's, I think that's what the goal of science should and needs to be. We, we, we can have solutions where we get to maintain a, a, a life that we enjoy that with all the benefits that, uh, that science has brought us without creating the negative impacts. Right, but you know, we need harp, we, uh, you mentioned sustainability, which is kind of the word we all like to operate under. <laughs> Two funny things about that. One is like, that word sucks. Oh, it it's totally, a lie. Yeah. <laughs> if, no, it, well, no, but I mean, like if you went to, um, you know, like, hey, how's your marriage? You know, and so he said, well, it's sustainable. It's like, sustainable. Oh, dude, I'm so sorry, yeah. man. You know, they have counselors for this. You can get help. I mean, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, I, I think we need marketing people to help us kind of like, maybe it ought to be like, you know, I don't know, thrive or live yeah. well, but without destroying the planet. I mean, can yeah. we? But the second thing that makes this so shocking is like, no, in the etymology of like, the Western languages, like the Greek and Roman roots of our languages in the West, there was never a word ever. Nobody ever thought of a word that said, how do you run a civilization without destroying it? They never thought of it. But other cultures around the world, not all of them, but many do have concepts like mm. this, whether it's seven generations or whether it's, you know, Gaia or, you know, other things. We kind of, kind of you know, people running the world right now, I, I think some of our culture is broken. We don't even know how to talk about living well in a world without destroying it. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact we can, don't even have language for that is kind of strange to me, but um, I guess we have to invent that, like a whole bunch of other new things. Um, but your point is like, we're gonna, when we get to a sustainable world, and I think we will, I'm going to look in the rearview mirror and go like, why did it take us so damn long? This is awesome. What, what the hell were we so worried about? This is freaking great. You know, <laughs> like, why, we, why were we so I worried? Yeah, and I think there is a word. I think there is a word. I think there's a word, which is stewardship. Which is yeah, which is yeah. taking taking the world as it is and and handing it off to a next generation, in more or less intact uh, fashion, you know. Uh, and I think that's the I think that's the part that's been missing uh, mm -hmm. in the culture, uh, as you say, not having a, a focus on a, a word or, or a, a a defined meaning for this. Which is that we haven't really had these conversations about handing that world, the world as we found it, off to the next generation preserved. Here we enjoyed it. We didn't ruin it. We didn't tear it down. We didn't burn it to the ground. We just lived here and handed it off to you so that you can do the same. And that's the part that is sort of missing. Well, that's. What I think is really interesting, in particular about Project Drawdown, um, but about in particular, the, the climate solutions that have to do with empowering women and uh, making sure everyone has healthy food available and not wasting food and all these sorts of things uh, is that there's this kind of Venn diagram that I feel like has not really been talked about until now. And that is the connection between uh, taking care of our environment and solving these, these problems related to climate change and social justice. Because so often people have told me, I can't talk to my sixth graders who aren't sure where dinner's coming from about climate change 
They have bigger issues. And it's this idea that it's actually all connected that I think is what's going to push this forward faster and, and, and in a better way is where you start to connect those dots between social justice, between empowering people and getting to the right place on climate action where those things overlap, I think is the part that I'm most excited about. I think you're right. I mean, in some ways, but um, absolutely, because um, there are synergistic challenges and, and solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you, thanks for mentioning that too. Like in Drawdown, we uh, actually our number like five and six solutions are like family planning and empowering women and educating girls. And then we have another solution around indigenous communities because they're like, hey, it turns out that indigenous communities steward their land better yeah. and they tend to have more carbon and more biodiversity and they suck more air, carbon out of the air for us. Yeah. Who knew, right? Well, of course we knew, but hey, that makes sense. Um, but I do worry if we go too far um, of putting too much in the sink, if you will, kind of a mm -hmm. kitchen sink, like the Green New yeah. Deal is being talked a lot about and it combines a lot of uh, really good things like environmental solutions and social justice and economic development. So great. But if the rhetoric around that, um, I worry the Green New Deal sounds too lefty now mm -hmm. and it's going to leave behind a whole, like no Republican could possibly vote for it. Mm -hmm. And um, given how polarized we are, and that didn't used to be the case. And so I'm wondering, you know, where do we find, like, maybe is it helping farmers? You know, that's a bipartisan, you know, maybe we can chip away at these environmental social justice problems where we can build bridges, not create walls. I'm not a big fan of walls, you know, and, um, but it's, I just worry about the rhetoric of Washington. Like, you know, I pr really strongly believe that social and environmental issues are intimately connected, but yes. sometimes people use these as political wedges to divide us. And both the left and the right are doing it right now. Uh, we may pick a side and like one more than the other, but they're both trying to polarize us, let's be honest, and vote for me, not the other guy. And I'm like, hey, look, this atmosphere doesn't give a shit. Or, oh, did I say that on here? <laughs> give up. <a, laughs> um, it doesn't care. And uh, we have to find solutions, whether they're, you know, red states or blue states, small towns or big cities. And ironically, you know, Republicans in throughout American history, until very recently anyway, have been the environmental party, frankly. Right. Uh, it was Richard Nixon who founded the EPA, who signed the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and so on. It was George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, was the best, uh, I think, uh, science-supporting president we've had in our lifetime. Uh, and uh, the budgets for science were the least interfered with and the highest adjusted for inflation we've ever seen. And, you know, you think that today, like what? But um, it's true. So I, I kind of hope we can find these social and environmental solutions, but ones that can not get bogged down in politics. And uh, I worry, um, I love the aspirations of a Green New Deal and what it's trying to do, but I worry the framing of it may alienate automatically 50% of the people who have to vote for it. Yeah, I think that's fine, though. I think yeah. that's I think that's a, no, I think that's OK. My 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 biggest fear of this whole thing is for. Right? Yeah, I'm going to finish my thought. My biggest fear in this whole thing has been for too long. There wasn't a push too far to the left or too far in the in the favor of the environment, because what over and over again we see was when there's a group that's pushing beyond that boundary, beyond that limit, they shift everything that direction, whether or not they are successful. Yeah. And so and so to have a, at least somebody going out there and saying these are the absolute things that should be done to address this, it can move it in that direction even if it's not successful itself. It doesn't bounce away from that direction typically. Yeah, that old uh, Overton window thing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah well point. well point. Yeah, it's complicated stuff, but it's worth, you know, I guess the point is we shouldn't think about environmental issues in isolation. I think we can all agree on that. Like when we do, we run into trouble. And but if we and but the point Justin made earlier too is also like we have to be thinking of the intergenerational, you know, kind of obligation we have, and we all inherited the work of thousands of generations. I mean, something like a human being. What did, what did we depart from the great apes about? What, six million years ago, right? So something like three hundred thousand generations of something that ended up being humans. They've been walking this planet, and each generation made the world a little bit better for the next one. And we certainly benefited from that. I, you know, you and I didn't have to invent fire or the wheel or the internet or whatever. You know, it was all kind of waiting for us. But we also had a pristine planet for most of that time. And now we're going to be the first generation in history to, I hate to say this, but we're deliberately and consciously leaving a degraded future for our children. And we're doing it fully aware that we are doing it. No politician or leader around the world can say, oh, I didn't know. 
mean, we've scientists have been shouting this for decades now. I mean, come on. Uh, they can't say they didn't know. They just have to say, well, I didn't care. And I don't think that's true. I think they do. They're just feeling, you know, we do care. And that's why things like drawdown and just saying, how do I get started? Where can we get some traction on solutions? Um, it turns out despair is a really bad strategy for making the world better. Yeah. And if you don't believe in a better future, you can't build it. Uh, I'm always reminded, like Martin Luther King never said, I have a nightmare. Uh, he said, <laughs> he didn't. He, I have a dream of a world that's better. It may be challenging for a lot of us right now. Like, oh gosh, I don't know if I can get to that world, but everybody kind of knew in their gut, yeah, that's better. It's going to be hard and we may not be perfect on the way, but we should ultimately try to get there. Same thing with like the environment and intergenerational and sustainability. Like, hey, there's a better world out here. We can get there if we choose to. There's nothing stopping us from stopping climate change except ourselves. There's nothing stopping us from making a better world for our children except ourselves. So I say, do it. Let's go do this. Let's make that better world. And it's totally there. Um, and we just have to make our choice. Like every generation before made a grand choice about who they were and what they stood up for. That's our turn. And uh, I, I'm convinced we get there to have to do. What is one thing that you want our listeners to take home with them? What one thing that they, what, what, what is one thing that they should do? Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Um, hope is a completely essential part of the solution to climate change. I'm not being a Pollyanna saying, oh, it's all going to be fine. We just have to let the market sort it out or technology. No, hope is an active verb. It means to get up in the morning and look, you know, look a problem square in the eye, knowing you may fail, but you get up and do it anyway. It's courage. It's hope mixed together. It's like making the world better for a moral imperative that, you know, we want to be the people who leave a better world to the future. You know, I want to be a good ancestor. I want people to hundred years from now to look at our time in history and say, yeah, they almost screwed up badly, but a few people rally together, inspired the rest, and they pulled it off just on the brink and brought the world back to a beautiful future. And here we are, the recipients of that incredible uh, gift, that incredible insight, that incredible body of work that billions of people pull together to pull off. I want to be part of that. And I think we all do. So I'd say hope and courage in equal proportions is what the world needs. And don't let anybody tell you different. Where can people find you online and find more information about the solutions that Project Drawdown offers? Yeah, well, um, you can find Drawdown and all the stuff around it on uh, drawdown.org, which is uh, our website and a book you can go get on Amazon if you like. There you go. Thank you. And then uh, me personally, I'm uh, on all the all the little interwebs um, in various places as Global Eco Guy um, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and even LinkedIn, I guess. So if you want to follow me, I'm happy to, but probably Twitter is the best place for that. And, uh, uh, and if anybody wants to, um, you know, send me a question or something on Twitter, I'll, be, I'll try to respond. That would be wonderful. And we will put links on our website as well so that people, if they're listening to this later, they can find a link and, uh, and follow you easily. Well, thank thanks. you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for doing this show, too. This is great. Uh, anything that gets more science out of the world is a good thing. So thank you for your work. Well, thank you. We keep thank trying. You. We like well, the science. We keep trying to talk about it. Get other yeah. people interested. Good. You know. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good yeah. night, then. You <laughs> good too. Night. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dan. Cheers. Okay, bye-bye. That was Dr. Jonathan Foley from Project Drawdown. And again, if you're interested, projectdrawdown.org or Global Eco Guy, you can follow him on Twitter. It is now time for us to take a break. We'll be back with science. We've got all sorts of science news lined up for you for the second half of the show. So without any further ado, I would love you to stay tuned for more This Week in Science. <laughs>
Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. Thank you for listening listening to another episode of This Week in Science. We are so glad that you are here with us for this show. I want you to know about a Kickstarter that's going on. If you recall our house band for our live show, the PDX Broadsides, they are having a Kickstarter to fund their new album and East Coast tour. And so if you are able and interested back the project the broadsides give us some amazing musical entertainment they have wonderful songs full of stories and fun and science and whimsy and you got to back that they are uh, looking for a goal of twelve thousand five hundred dollars for their new album and tour their new album relatable content it contains a song about serotonin and dopamine, which you can actually go back and listen to the last song of our live show at the Alberta Rose Theater. Uh, that, that was the song that they played. Serotonin and dopamine, the neurotransmitters. Oh, we miss them when they're gone. But uh, this is a house uh, family-friendly album. And I do hope that you will help support the broadsides. And along those lines of support, if you are interested in supporting This Week in Science, we bring you this show every week and don't really ask for much. But if you are able, please head over to twist.org. Twist.org is where you can find all the information about our website. And if you have not yet subscribed, then you can subscribe very easily by clicking on the orange subscribe button. It allows you to go to YouTube, iTunes, or the Google. Google podcast uh, directory to be able to subscribe on the platform of your choice. Choose one, choose them all. Tell a friend to do the same. Also at twist.org, you can find a little yellow donate button that allows you to donate a little bit of cash through PayPal. If that is something you feel is, is that you'd like to do, you can also donate through Patreon. Click on the Patreon link at the top of our our page. It'll take you to our Patreon community page, patreon.com slash this week in science. You just click on the become a patron button and there are so many choices, but really, you know, if you choose $10 a month, you can choose $10 or more, but at $10 a month, that's where we start saying thank you to you by name at the end of the show. That's it. It's just $10 with the number of shows we do every month, usually four to five shows a month. That's about the price of a cup of coffee a week. And so if you can listen to this show and think we're worth a cup of coffee, please please donate at $10 a month. It's a pretty easy level. We'll also send you some little goodies in return for that support. We also have a Zazzle store where you can find twist merchandise, tote bags, t-shirts, mouse pads, mugs, all those things uh, that have twist logos on them or Blair's Animal Corner calendar art from years past. There's a new Kiwi tote bag in there that looks pretty awesome. Lots of cool items. You can support us because a portion of the proceeds from our Zazzle purchases goes to support this show. All of this support, it does help us do what we do. And you know what? Thank you for your support. We really could not do this without you. I can't explain the things you've heard more than intuition. A lot of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. And we're back with more this week in science. Oh, yeah, we are back. I've got science. But before we jump into that, it is time for this weekend. What has science done for me? 
Lately. Lately. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing. Harmonizing. Yeah. We're just harmonizing. This is the reason we didn't take the singing act on the road, is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, what has science well, we done talked. for us lately? Well, for Todd Barnell. It grabbed him up short and forced him to reevaluate his perceptions. Mm. Todd writes in, your interview with Dr. Helm was fascinating. Oh. I was hooked at the get-go since she is from the home of Pluto, too. And yes, all of us here still consider it a planet. I was drawn in deeper as I had never heard of the Newston. And the whole topic yeah. was terribly fascinating. But then we got to marine debris. For the last yes. 17 years, I've had the good fortune to work with Native American environmental professionals across the country on waste management and other related issues. I have, shall we say, rather strong feelings when it comes to waste of various types and the effects that it has on our land, waters, and communities. The conversation took some unexpected turns for me that led to my stopping as I walked home and saying out loud, WTF! But then the scientist on my shoulder said, whoa, buddy, shut your mouth, <laughs> open your ears, and pay attention to where the studies are leading. It wasn't a comfortable experience by a long shot, but it has led me to read more, to question my assumptions, and to remember that when it comes to things being black and white, well, those are penguins, not situations in real life. Once again, science reminded me to not get too comfortable and to follow the facts. Um, also, penguins also have pink on them. I'll just say real quick. Sometimes, not all of them. <laughs> and, and who sent this in again? Todd Barnell. Todd, thank you thank so you, much. This was, I love that you had this reaction that uh, an interview on our yeah. show could have brought you not only new information, but as you said, a new perspective. I mean, this kind of letter, this kind of, uh, this, this is, this, this is why I do this. And, this and, is to, and to recap, yeah, but this to recap science. for the, for recap for the audience really quickly, uh, the Newston that he's talking about is a vitally important ecosystem that's right on the surface of the ocean. Uh, it's a very, it's not very deep, but it's very important to the, to the ocean's health. And it tends to gravitate around those areas where, the debris, the, the plastics, the, the plastic islands are forming. So that the, the argument for picking up and collecting that plastic to remove it to the, from the ocean, while it sounds nice, is highly disruptive to this vital ecosystem that follows the same pushes of current that the plastics follow mm -hmm. and is actually has a net negative effect on the ocean by removing the plastic. Totally unintuitive, not mm -hmm. the thing that we would have, we, we would have felt or thought without having those facts, having that understanding that uh, Dr. Helm brought. And so that's why it was such a challenging, unintuitive and fascinating interview and, and story. Yeah. I highly recommend uh, everyone, if you are up to it, going back and taking a listen, or if you haven't heard it, looking for it, I will put a link to that interview in our show notes. So to make it easy for you to find in conjunction with this, what has science done for me lately? Wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everyone out there, continue to bring us the science stories from your life. What has science done for you lately? We want to know. Let us. I want to know. You know <laughs> what you're thinking. Okay. okay. Again, there's a reason this is a talk show, people. That's right. <laughs> I'll sing if I want to. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to just continue the, this triggered this song in my brain wormhole. Uh, yes, please, please, please send us your stories about what science has done for you lately. They really fill this show and us with a lot of joy. And I know, I, I know a lot of you really enjoy this part of the show too. Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com is my email if you want to send it to me there, or you can leave a message on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash this week in science, send, a, send us a message, message there. So we can keep filling this segment of the show with your stories. Now on to the science.
All right. How did you get to be so tall? All right. It's a well, question. my dad was really tall. My mom is small. not. I started very small. Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up in between. in between. Right. And we've got this vague idea of how tall you're going to grow. But, you know, doctors aren't always right because we they don't know everything about the genetics behind why we grow to the heights that we do. In fact, there are lots of genes responsible and although we know that the heights of our parents are important and probably make up about 80% of that, uh, of the basis of our height, based on twin studies and other, other uh, studies that have been done on family lineages, they've determined that. They went looking for the genes, and over many years, we've done various studies looking for the genes that actually determine how tall we're going to be. And uh, several years back, there was a genome-wide association study, but its uh, its numbers, the genes that it's that it found, didn't add up to the amount of influence that genetics should have <laughs> on our height. And so people kind of went, "Uh, is our idea of heredity and genetics?" broken somewhere is there something we don't understand and there have been a few other studies where these genome-wide association studies they look at um, many many uh, genes using single nucleotide polymorphisms SNPs uh, from the genome not actual whole genome not looking at the whole genome but just these little bits and pieces to be able to determine what changes from generation to generation and what genes may be responsible it's given a good sense of how genetics are responsible, but not the whole sense. And so some researchers who just published a study in, uh, let's see, I think it's in BioArchive, and it's, uh, it's in publication right now. It's supposed to be published to Nature, I believe. But the, uh, it was published in the BioArchive preprint server. Researchers from King's College, London, they said, okay, genome-wide association studies not giving us the full picture. Let's look at whole genomes from over 21,000 people. Hmm. It's a good sample size. <laughs> good sample size. They, they're like, we're not going to take these little bits and pieces. We're just going to look at these European descent people, 21,000 whole genomes, compared them, and looked at the differences and the similarities to find what may be responsible. And what they determined is that rare gene variants are actually very important. They add up in little bits and pieces to make up what was missing from the genome-wide association studies. And their result actually equals the hypothesized, the expected estimate of genetic heritability at around 79% for mm. height. Mm. Cuz so the rest of it is environmental yeah. factors, right? Yeah. There's yeah, a huge right. there's a huge part of that because yeah. there, this was like this was like this uh I don't know it's it's not science you think. But when the Americans went to back went to Europe to fight in World War II, they were extremely tall compared to the peoples there. Even though genetically you could say this was, you know, largely Americans were largely European descendants, but it was because of the, uh, you know, the, the beef and corn raised Americans uh, had a different nutritional supply uh, growing up. So that's, so, yeah, so that's the 20%. That's the, that's the additional possibility. Okay. The, right. But genetics determines about 80% yeah. of yeah. your, so, your height potential. And, uh, and but there have been these questions of since there are hundreds of genes mm. responsible, what genes may actually be making the difference in uh -huh. in a person's height? And mm. so it's these the total amount of rare variants, and it's not these huh. other genes that are more responsible responsible. And so what they say their next stage is to do is to go and find out which of the rare variants are important for the height. They also looked at body mass index, BMI, That's... and that had a little bit um, less, but it did align with the hypothesized genetic 
contribution for BMI, which is about 40%. So and so they, they looked at these things, but they want to look at which rare variants actually have the most influence. And then not just for height and BMI, this was kind of a proof of concept mm -hmm. to show that the ideas behind genetics are not broken, that indeed- They're just hiding. Are, they're There's hiding just stuff there. hiding over here. Exactly. And they're, they are, they, they're, but genetics and the influence based because various genes work together and they influence yeah. each other. A lot of these rare variants they look at are actually not genes that pro code for proteins, but actually are genes that code for transcription factors that affect how different genes, how much protein gets produced by different, by different genes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these rare variants influence huh. The proteins that hopefully, go on to do stuff later. Hopefully on. they asked the question right and didn't just go with height. Uh, I, I went to a physical therapist mm. once that told me I have an unusually long abdomen, which I bragged about for yeah. almost a day before my best friend says, that is the short nicest leg. way anybody can say you have short legs. Yes, they don't break. Yeah. If your legs were longer, they'd have just said you were tall. They don't break it down unless it's unproportional. Right. So, so is it, is, is, are, are we comparing the same genes with people with very long legs and short torsos as we are with our long torso and short leg brethren? But that's it's, not the, that's not the question. The question is, I mean, that's just how, how your genes worked out to make you grow. So that's heritable wow. at some, that's comes from certain genes that mm -hmm. grew at certain rate that made proteins go at certain right. rates during different times during development, but, whether or not, but, no, it, no. And so, but it's a trait amongst is, people from Sicily too. It's a, it's also like, you will see traits from the so people of Bergen, of uh, people of like the, arguing. Oh, the, that it, <laughs> like you're just uh, talking to talk at this point and I like, no, I was making a point, but go ahead. Well, me, <laughs> no, well, me. What, was you're trying to make because when you're talking about the the genes that are responsible there are hundreds of them that work together to create the genetic contribution contribution that 80 percent that goes to being this is what genes are responsible for in your height versus the 20 percent of environment and now we know that there are more genes out there than we knew about before and the question is which of them are really important for the trait of height and which of them uh, are possibly being uh, selected against through natural selection. Like maybe some of them are being weeded out and aren't as important to height as others because maybe they're harmful in some way. Um, and so how can we take these gene variants and look at them to potentially get drugs that can target height to allow people to be taller? Oh, like, can we do that? But even beyond height and body mass index, can we can we use these rare gene variants to address diseases? That's and more what I was thinking is that, you know, the height thing is fun to talk about, but really this is about genetic indicators where they're hiding elements that we don't know about. That's really the moral of this story, it sounds like. That it is. You got yeah. it. Yeah. That nice. is exactly it. But also... For the little kids whose parents say, drink that milk so you'll grow up big and strong. You now know that's a bunch of hooey. 80% decided by DNA. No more milk, mom. No, drink your milk because 20%. 20%. 20 no, that's still a pretty big. What's 20% of your height? That's, that's many inches. Many inches. Yes. I mean, for myself personally, you know, Justin's talking about his abdomen versus his legs. I have scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spine. And every time I've gone in for an x-ray, the doctor inevitably says, oh, if your back weren't this curved, you'd be at least three inches taller. <laughs> You're like, I know. See, oh, insult. Oh. You're adding this to the injury. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. Um. And then moving on from, from height and body mass and genes, let's talk about creating speech. That's important. Um, it is important. And we have talked on the show previously about uh, research to create brain-computer interfaces that interface with the brain to enable, to enable um, speech. So the idea is that at some point, 
point in the future, individuals who are unable to speak for whatever reason, as long as areas of their brain are active that could try to produce speech, that you could have a brain computer interface that would allow these people to interact through speech with the world. And so we, uh, a few months ago, I, I brought up a, um, I brought up a story where researchers had used the kind of vocoder and neural network uh, technology that's been used by Apple to create Siri's voice to enable the recording of vocal uh, sounds and also neural activity related to those sounds to get computer to produce speech sounds. And we listened to it and it was, it wasn't great. Creepy. It was creepy. Creepy. Mm -hmm. creepy. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was creepy. Uh, definitely in the uncanny valley side of things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the but we could understand it, it read off numbers and we could understand the majority of those numbers. And in fact, people were able to understand those numbers at about 75% accuracy. <sighs> and so this study looking uh, at a different way of decoding neural signals. This It's a different team. The previous study we talked about was from Columbia University. This study is from University of California, San Francisco. The researchers, uh, instead of taking input from the Columbia group, used the sensory system, the auditory cortex, and used the neural signals of what the brain was hearing. This UCSF team had epilepsy patients with, uh, with interfaces that were actually hooked into their motor cortex. So there were little needles, little detectors in their motor cortex during brain surgery, had them say sentences, and they picked up the motor cortex's activity of what the motor cortex would be making the vocal apparatus, the mouth, the tongue, the epiglottis, uh, do muscularly, muscularly do during sound production. And they used those, mu those signals that would have gone directly to the vocal apparatus to produce sound. They used those neural signals to get their computer to pump out sound. And so huh. they, uh, they did a number of, um, of sentences that were uh, that were created, and let's see if I can get one here for you. Oh, it's not loud enough, maybe. Oh, I have it turned down. Hold on, that's my problem. The proof that you are seeking is available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. I got the some of it. Is available in books. Kind of sounds like somebody has a bunch of marshmallows in their mouth. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. That was a rough one. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. And so the results of this study, which the uh, it, it really has jumped things forwards in, in a sense, because uh, they are, instead of doing individual words and having the computer create individual mm. words from this neural activity, they are creating sentences. So natural speech at the rate of natural speech, which is at about 150 words per minute, and they were doing it in real time. So it wasn't bring an activity recorded and then put out of the computer later. This is, uh, they're creating a real-time brain translation process. And uh, in doing this, uh, subjects who listened to these sentences were able to accurately translate or understand the sentences about 45% of the time. It's amazing. So, but overall, the number of words that could be understood, not complete sentences translated, but number of words, it was about 70% accuracy. Mm -hmm. So it, this is, it's, it's not perfect, but it's also really not that bad. So the, here's what, here's what I'm seeing. Last week, we had a story about pig heads 
<laughs> where they were able to uh, keep pumping happening so that the brain was having circuitry that was working out. So basically the, the whole idea, if you want to go crazy far uh, into the science fiction realm of the head in the jar, kind of right. Mm -hmm. The, the, the beginnings of that potential stuff paired with this, you have a talking brain in a jar. You have full on Krang capabilities here. I'm also curious to see if I sing better in my thoughts. Well, they were not able to get inflection yet. So I feel like you'd be really good at <laughs> auto-tune to one note. That's right. Auto-tune. You could auto-tune. That'd be great. That's what yeah. auto-tune is for. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, but the uh so the researchers a lie in... detector, it's a it's a telepathy machine. It's a oh my Ooh. goodness, you can contact people. I didn't think about that. Oh you could, no, you could reverse the you could reverse engineer it so you could talk to somebody in a coma and maybe hear a response. Oh it's there's a whole bevy of things that this I want to flip the table. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are so many things that it, should they get this technology really off the ground, um, it could uh, it could have huge impacts. The uh, addition. What are babies saying? Yeah, <gasps> well, no, I don't think that would work out. Yeah, because they don't know how to speak yet. No, so. but they, but no, but they but they recognize words. Uh, what, is, what is your dog able to communicate if they don't have to rely on the vocal cords? Well, it's so so. To... Justin, I don't know if you heard at the very beginning that this is the. It's not us thinking of the word. It's the brain telling the mouth to move is what they're recognizing. Yeah, they are they are recording from the motor cortex, which yeah. is sending the the signals to the muscles to move. So what you have to have had, even if you have the in, you I don't have the ability to speak. You would have had to have the experience, the understanding. Mm -hmm. the 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 neurons are firing, but the body is unresponsive. Right in, in any right. scenario. Uh, but the motor uh, uh, neurons are still firing as if they were operating the machinery, and that would be able to still communicate. Yeah. Interesting. So somebody who's become uh, paraplegic, for instance, right. should right. have the motor neurons firing in a way that that mm -hmm. that would have uh, affected speech and allowed speech mm -hmm. to happen, and so would still be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. <sighs> So this would be something of an improvement over Stephen Hawking's voice technology. Yes. It would definitely have helped someone like him. Um, it'd be interesting from this uh, this article that I'm reading here. In addition to the study, one participant was asked to speak the sentence by miming the words in his vocal tract. So not actually saying the words, but miming them. And the uh, computer interface was able to synthesize intelligible speech from that miming. Mm. So it, it suggests that they really are getting at it. Um, and the they found that the even though they didn't work with any patients who had speech disabilities, this is only looking at like five individuals with epilepsy, but with no speech disabilities. Um, they did find that their the vocal cord and vocal tract movements were similar enough between individuals that they could develop that they may be able to develop a universal decoder so it wouldn't have to be something that is unique to each person wow yeah, which that in itself would be pretty amazing. So they're going to hopefully move on to clinical trials testing the technology in the future. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. It's awesome. cool. The future is today. Well, it's not today. It's tomorrow-ish. It'll happen. It's right now. Now. No, now. 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 <laughs> not, now. Not quite oh. no, not oh, okay. Nope. Uh, and for, for most people, the future happened a long time ago and they didn't notice. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and also big drawback to this is that you have to have a pretty big invasive brain implant. Mm -hmm. So technology for brain implants needs to improve or technology oh. enabling us to record from outside the skull easily has to become uh, more fine tuned and 
exact. So right about now, it's not going to be something that everybody's going to want because there's a lot of wires and cables and you'd have a pretty, pretty big hole in your head. Or you take the brain out. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. put it in a jar, in jar that it's accessible. That's right. We talked about that. Anyway. All right. Justin, what do you have? Of all the creatures that could uh, make good public ambassadors for global warming and climate change, uh, penguins are pretty good. We like, everybody likes penguins. Yeah. What about baby penguins? Mm. Oh, baby, baby animals penguins. are always better. <laughs> well, baby penguins are dying off in record numbers thanks to global warming. <sighs> Sorry. Bad news. Uh, this is the bad news, good news uh, segment I'm doing this week. Uh, on global warming. This is the bad news part. Emperor penguins at the Haley Bay colony in the Weddell Sea have failed to raise chicks to adulthood for the, or even adolescence for the last three years running. And now the colony itself is pretty much gone, which is a big deal because until recently, the Haley Bay colony was the second largest in the world with the number of breeding pairs averaging between years somewhere between 14,000 and 25,000 making them at any given year 5 to 9% of the global emperor penguin population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened to these poor penguins? Changes in sea ice conditions. The emperor penguins need to have a, a very stable ice upon which to breed, and it has to stay that way uh, from April when the birds first arrive until December when the chicks uh, sort of go off on their own and become... Self-sustaining penguins. For the last 60 years, the Haley Bay site has been stable. So this is where penguins have been breeding en masse year after year. In 2016, after a period of uh, rough weather, sea ice broke up as soon as October, just a you know, few months before the baby penguins were ready to go out on their own. And so they pretty much all died. And this happened in Again in 2017 and it happened again in 2018 and each time pretty much all the babies were dead and now the penguins aren't going there anymore yeah that's what i was gonna say is i'm sure the the adult group is shrinking not just because they're also dying but because they're going somewhere else so and that's right yeah. so so the good news in this is that there is a neighboring group of emperor penguins uh and their numbers have swelled Mm -hmm. Why? Ah, the, the, the penguins moved. A lot of them did. Mm -hmm. uh, they lost three generations of offspring wow. uh, before they, they realized that this was not going to be sustainable. Because again, what keeps happening to them is at the beginning and through most of the season, everything is fine. Right. It's just shortened yeah. at the end when the, 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 the young penguins are not quite ready. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. thrown out to the cold cold world which is actually where penguins live that's, that's how they in the them. cold cold world in the mm -hmm. cold cold world yeah. yeah but if it's too early they don't have their uh their waterproof feathers yet and they're still fluffy that's problematic yeah they they're yeah the penguins not are dying waterproof the yet cutest, which is really sad not so yet waterproof. Uh, also then uh, another global warming -ish story uh svalbard reindeer these are short thick round uh, smallish reindeer, they're the northernmost living reindeer on the planet. Uh, they, they are less active. You know, you, we, we picture reindeer as you know, pulling sleighs or like running around like caribou. Yeah, these ones pretty much just sit around. Reindeer are caribou. Yeah, yeah. I think mean, we picture that. I, I, the one I picture is I picture like the Alaskan caribou in these herds that are running full tilt and they're, you know, uh, these ones not so much. Yeah, they just chill. Uh, but they've noticed that they have been doing something recently in the light of global warming, which is they've started to add seaweed to their diet. These are, I think, Nor Norway adjacent uh, reindeer, uh, and they've started they've started switching up their diet to include uh, uh, the, the 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 food from the sea, which isn't a thing that they've done before, but. Um, this is one of these things that, that we're going to start seeing more and more, which is which is the uh, animals on the planet changing behaviors, changing diets, looking for different food sources, if, those ones that will adapt 
to this climate change in order to survive. And it's probably not a bad idea if we do it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, re I remember there was a, a while ago we, we mentioned that we found out that uh, Arctic deer of some sort, I don't recall, were eating, um, they were scavenging meat. They were eating yeah. carrion because there's not a lot of plants around when it's very, very cold. Uh, but it just shows that, you know, all these animals that we consider to have very specific diets, it's because what it's, it's what's around. And when there's other things around, they'll figure it out. Yeah. I do, around. I do wonder if the seaweed diet is giving them everything that they need. So they're not able to get their normal grasses for it might actually be better. Yeah. For, like, That's a good seaweed question. Seaweed is very, I would imagine it's nutritious, but I yeah. wonder, I wonder if it's giving them what they need, if, if they have to eat more of it, or if, you know, I would love to know how it's affecting their nutrition. Yeah. So a reminder to, to everybody is that seaweed is not strictly speaking a plant. <laughs> it's an algae. <laughs> so yeah. Um, in terms of the nutritional we eat it. Humans Stuff eat it. That's in there. We eat it, but it is very different from eating grass. Mm -hmm. Very different. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I wonder how that would affect him. Interesting. Mm. Oh, hey. Is that it? Is that it then, Justin? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what time is it then? I think I What know time is it? it? It's time for Blair's Animal <gasps> Corner. <laughs> I have some mice who want you to take your shoes off before you come in the home. Uh, so this is from the University of British Columbia, looking at how mice like to live. Uh, quite a long time ago now, I think, we talked on the show about how a recent study on, at the time, recent, now a long time ago, a study on laboratory mouse, mice found that we were holding them at the wrong temperature <laughs> and that it was stressing them out and that that might affect uh, research that the we've done on those laboratory mice. Uh, uh, not beneficial. Yeah. So I brought this story because it's kind of similar. They were looking at how mice like to live. This, again, from University of British Columbia, looking at the way mice usually are housed in laboratory conditions, which is in um, just a single space, like a box or a simple, simple, simple cage, one small open space. And then they also took some uh, of the mice. This is a 15-week study. They took some mice and they had them in three compartments that had connections. So they had their one space or they had these three separate spaces. And they found that it looks like mice really like to have a quote-unquote ensuite bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, so they found out that um, the ones that were in these three individual spaces made a real effort to use separate enclosures for nesting and for defecating. And even the ones in single compartments appeared to make an effort to keep them separate, nesting and waste, within that one singular space. So this is interesting because, like I said, in laboratory conditions, it's one space. That's really it. <laughs> and so if this is something that they'd prefer, this might have an impact on future studies. Um, this is also interesting because it might have some sort of implication for um, reduction of disease transmission and this kind of em emotion of disgust for feces and urine that we hold if this permeates through the animal kingdom to a much earlier common ancestor. It would make sense to think that pee and poo is gross because it could get us sick. So evolutionarily, that is a trait that makes sense to conserve. So 
if there's this desire to keep separate where you sleep and where you poop, and it's way back in the evolutionary tree, this is something that we we need to start looking at in other species. And in particular, what I think this is most clearly leading to is a stress hormone study with these mice. I think that is the clear next step. It doesn't say anything about that in the press release here, but I really feel like that has to be the next thing because if we are deciding if science, if scientific community, the scientific community that uses mice suddenly decides, uh-oh, we have to house them differently. The science behind that should be, is this affecting the, the output of our research? Because if it is, that's at, we absolutely need to give them separate laboratory space. We need to give them their ensuite bathroom. <laughs> if it is not affecting research projects, I think still this means this would make them more comfortable to find a way to relegate that stuff to a separate space, give them the proper nesting material and dividers and whatever it is. But if we can identify how they are most at ease, if this is indeed affecting research, if there's some sort of confounding variable coming from this because they're grossed the, out all the time. If the compounding variables made it to the news, exercise is good for your heart. If you sleep in your own feces, news at 11. <laughs> like <they> would be. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so yeah, so it's this question of, um, have we been doing tests on stress hormones and disease transmission in mice when they're already stressed out about disease transmission because they're, they're pooping where they're sleeping. Yeah. And, it, and, uh, and part of the study shows that they don't build these nice nests when they are in dirtier situations. And so yeah. not having a nice place to sleep is going to affect probably their mm -hmm. general health and well being mm -hmm. and lead to further stress. And so there may mm -hmm. just be this uh, feedback loop situation. Yeah. Going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, absolutely. So on one side, we have this question about the efficacy of our. Uh, of our rodent studies in the scientific community. On the other side, this really interesting evolutionary question. When in evolutionary history did life decide, I don't want to poop where I sleep? <laughs> and did it happen many times? Did it happen one time and it permeated through the animal kingdom? We don't know. It's a little bit built into the design too of... of... Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We, we, put, we put the other end Unless at the other end snail. for a reason. Snails have it rough. Some, some, not Comes out right it over out. their head. Not everybody yeah. had it figured out right. Yeah. Is that that's unfortunate? So that's you know their torsion, the way that they're they're twisted in their shell, it's pretty much right on top of their head. That's unfortunate. Glad mm. I'm not a snail. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you should be glad you're not a millipede. Oh, yeah. Glad I'm not a millipede. Why? Yes. Too much money spent on shoes. <laughs> that, for sure. This is a study from the Field Museum with uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and University of California, Davis, looking really? at how to identify near identical millipedes about uh, half an inch long, brown, <laughs> otherwise looking pretty similar. What they found was that these millipedes have some uh, sensitivity to ultraviolet light. So they were able to see things would glow different colors when they were looking at them in ultraviolet light. The idea to, to look at ultraviolet light makes sense. There's lots of other invertebrates that glow under UV light, like scorpions, for example. So this is a good way to to start looking at this. So if you're if you're trying to identify and speciate, like try to categorize a bunch of these half inch long millipedes, there's not a lot of options. When you think about electron microscopy, um, that's problematic because in order I didn't I guess I didn't realize this. In order to use a scanning electron microscope, you have to cover your specimen in a thin layer of gold. So that electrons bounce off of it. I, I must have forgotten this. And then the detector picture showing where the electrons deflected. The problem there is that that often destroys specimens. And the millipede specimens that the Field Museum was looking at 
were very old. There was one that was from 1887. And they are scientifically valuable because they have not yet been categorized. So they didn't know how to identify these millipedes without damaging in them, which is where this UV light comes in. They also used a brand new methodology in combination with discovering the fact that UV light is part of this equation, where they took a camera, they put it on a motorized lift that allowed the camera to move towards the specimen in teeny tiny increments. With each movement, a different part of it came into focus. And then they would have between 10 and 70 pictures. Picking The software would pick out what was in focus and it made a nice collage. So that way they were able to not damage the specimens at all. Once you shine UV light on that, there's even more stuff that becomes apparent. What stuff becomes apparent, you ask? I'm so glad that you asked. <laughs> so millipedes, they don't have quite the thousand legs that it sounds like they do from their name. These individuals in genus Pseudopolydesmus have around 70 legs. That's enough. It's enough. And here's a little sex ed lesson for millipedes. Male millipede sperm comes out from an opening behind their second pair of legs. Their seventh pair of legs are called... Is that from the front or the back? From the front, okay. I think. Oh, maybe not. Maybe from the back. That's a really good question. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll check. We'll, we'll revisit it in the after show. Okay. We'll edit it in later. Fix it in post. <laughs> uh, the seventh pair of legs are called gonopods, and they're adapted for transferring sperm to the female millipedes vulva, which vulvae, which are behind her second pair of legs. So it looks like he dips his gonopods into his ejaculate, which is a bluish liquid, and then goes in search of a female, walking around with sperm on his legs. Their gonopods have special features specific to their species. They have little knobs and bristles, kind of like a toothbrush, sorry, um, that helps them kind of hold on to the sperm, but it apparently also helps with the transfer. But where this comes into the previous conversation about cameras and identifying species is that they are specific to these species and they are easier seen through UV light. They're not sure if the the sperm liquid has to do with the reason they show up so beautifully in UV light or if it's just part of the structure of their bodies. But as far as they can tell, they can't see. Millipedes don't see well at all. So they're not seeing the difference in the light. We're, they don't know if they can see color. So most likely this fluorescence in UV is an artifact or byproduct of the chemical makeup of the cuticle covering the gonopod. It might make it stronger. It might help it catch the sperm. No idea. But so far, they have been able to, just with this new technology and being able to use the UV light, they have been able to sort these specimens into eight species, which is actually four fewer species than they had previously recognized. So it's the opposite of describing new species. They were able to put some of them back together that shouldn't have been separated out into separate species to begin with, all through the magic of UV light and sperm-covered legs. Wow. So biological artifact and wonderful scientific boom. Yeah. Those images are, <laughs> yeah. are really, really nice though. Um, pretty amazing. Yeah. And for those of you, if you, if you are listening to the podcast, there are images available and we will have a link in our show notes. If you want to go check out the link to the uh, release and the images they're beautiful, glowing. They look, I don't know, they look like flower parts almost. Yeah. So it Very looks good. like, uh, yep, the, the legs start at the head. I was correct. Okay. Yeah. So they're, they're opening to their, their, uh, their sperm or their, their 
sperm receiving areas are very close to their face, which is which, very which, interesting. Which makes it convenient too, because then you don't have to look back as far to make sure you're getting it. Yeah, yeah. Very close to their face. The sperm is released near the face. And spread over the legs. Spread over the legs. Yeah. And then, yeah, there you yeah. go. There you go. Thanks. The more you know. The more you know. Millipede yeah. walking sperm. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually makes sense because they grow from the le from the head out. They gain segments as they grow in age. Oh, that makes sense. So that would make so you perfect. You could have like you could have a a, a sixty leg, a sixty five leg. A, it's yeah. Oh, so it shows how old the millipede is. There you go. Oh, I did not know this. There you go. Very interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Blair. Mm -hmm. Let's jump into our quick stories to end this show. Do uh, it. Yeah, let's roll through it. Southern California, uh, we know, gets earthquakes. Well, it gets a lot more earthquakes than you ever thought. Researchers looked at earthquake data from uh, recorders that were spread out over uh, over Southern California between 2008 and 2017. They identified more than 1.8 million <laughs> previously unknown earthquakes. These earthquakes are little tiny earthquakes, little baby earthquakes, as small as 0.3 magnitude on the Richter scale. And they have estimated that in Southern California, um, that means that there is an earthquake happening approximately once every three minutes mm. or about, give or take, one every, uh, every 174 seconds. So right. even though you can't feel it necessarily, the ground is continuously shaking under your feet in Southern California. Yeah. Solid ground is a bit of an oxymoron, it turns out. Yeah. Altogether, the California earthquake catalog was missing some 1.6 million earthquakes. Wow. Missing earthquakes, the more you know. Um, and moving on from earthquakes to Mars quakes, the InSight lander on Mars has been digging into the surface of Mars to try and record sounds coming from the interior to help us understand what is going on in the inside of the red planet. Originally, it's been recording the shaking of its seismometer from wind on the surface of the planet, but today, NASA released the recording of what is potentially the first Mars quake. There is a, and there is an actual recording that, uh, that you can listen to. Should we listen to it right now? Ah. Should we, should we listen to this Mars quake? Please, please, please. It starts out with the sound of the wind. Ah, uh, but not any wind. Martian. Martian wind. This is Mars wind on the seismometer. And here comes. That slightly more intense noise is what they think was a Mars quake. And then they have, that is the sound of InSight's robotic arm. Now these sounds, uh, the Mars quake is not from tectonic activity like happens here on Earth. It is more from the planet slowly cooling over time and the crust cracking as it would. So it's not plates moving over a liquid mantle necessarily. It is um, just a slow drying out cooling and, and shrinking and cracking of the surface of the planet. Uh, and then my final story for the Please. night. Yeah. <laughs> my final story for the night. Um, researchers published in Frontiers in Psychiatry. This is work from uh, the School of Social Work at Ariel University and the Interdisciplinary Department of Social Sciences at Bar Ilan University. Researchers showed people um, seven seconds from Spider-Man 2 and Ant-Man, and those people who were afraid, had phobias of spiders or ants, 
became less afraid after watching these these Marvel movie clips. I remember lots of ants and Ant Ant Man, but I don't remember any actual spiders really in Spider Man. Were there a no, lot? Not so, a lot. No. So every <laughs> Spider Man story is the Spider Man origin story. I don't know why they can't move on from how he became Spider Man. They always have. And then he gets because he gets bit by a he spider, and everybody spider. wants to show yeah. that spider, and it's the only spider that you see. In, yeah. In yeah. But it every movie is the origin story. So you see it every movie. Yeah, it wasn't a significant reduction in phobia, but about 20% reduction. And the researchers say that uh, these results open up a new direction in the efficacy of positive exposure, which should be further considered because it's not scary, it's potentially fun for people to expose themselves to these things that they are normally afraid of, but it's in a not threatening situation. So Un yeah. Yeah, unthreatening situation. Yeah. Anyway, Unfortunately, people who saw the movie least. Wolverine <laughs> had a higher instance of being mauled by Wolverines. That's right. It's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Uh, Justin, you got a story? Yeah, so uh, this is... A thousand years ago-ish, the Wari Empire stretched across Peru. And it covers, because Peru is big. I don't know if you've ever looked at the Peruvian region on a map. Uh, it's uh, basically the eastern seaboard of the United States from New York to Jacksonville. Uh, they, they lasted, this, uh, this empire, for 500 years. So we're just, what, a couple ticks over 150 here. And yeah, we might still make it as a nation. Uh, but this is 500 years of a relatively stable society. <clears throat> Eventually, this gave rise to the Incan civilization. So this is pre-Inca. Uh, question is, how did they last so long and over such a large territory cohesively? And the answer that the researchers came up with, a steady supply of beer. <laughs> Apparently is what did it. Uh, Quotey voice. This study helps us understand how beer fed the creation of complex political organizations, says Ryan Williams, associate curator, head of anthropology at the Field Museum of Chicago, lead author of the study. We were able to apply new technologies to capture information on how ancient beer was produced and what it meant to societies in the past. So, uh, Somewhere around 20 years ago, they discovered uh, a brewery in the mountains of southern Peru. It was a, a full-fledged production house of beer, uh, like a microbrewery in some respects, says Williams. Since the beer that they brewed uh, there, called chicha, was only good for about a week after being made, and it wasn't shipped anywhere, people had to go during a festival to the brewery to drink it and they did they came from all over the region all of the political elites all the the people who uh were important uh, or wanted the, those who wanted to be seen and see others they would all go to this one brewery for this festival and they they would drink from these three foot tall <laughs> beer steins that were made to look like either important uh, figures in their history or leaders or the gods that they that they held there. Uh, Quotey voice again, Williams. People would come into the site in these festive moments in order to recreate and reaffirm their affiliation with the Wari Lords and maybe bring tribute and pledge loyalty to the Wari state. And so basically, yeah, beer kept an empire together for five Hundred years. What well, the way so they, they had an annual beer festival? They're like, come drink yeah. the beer, pledge your loyalty. We'll, yeah. we'll, we're happy. So, so the way that they discovered too, the uh, they they kind of know what was in the beer. All they have is these shards, these clay shards, uh, where the, the, the vessels that the beer was held in. Uh, but what they did was they shot a la uh, a laser at these shards and removed a tiny bit of me uh, material with the laser. Then they heated that tiny bit of material up to the temperature of our sun, hmm. broke down all the molecules that made it up. And from there, the researchers were able to tell at, well, on the atomic level, 
atomic elements that made up the sample, how many uh, there were there, and that information told researchers exactly where the beer, what, what the beer was made of, where the clay came from. And what they narrowed it down to is a, oh, where is it here? Uh, a pepperberries is what, something that is it. I don't know. These scientists are really taking home brewing to a whole new level. Right. Trying to figure out how to brew their own ancient so the, beer. Yes, yeah, so the clay was made locally. The pepperberries uh, are a super drought resistant crop. So uh, the beer supply could remain even in times of drought. With the food supply could go up and could go down. Corn could go up and could go down. Game could go up and all these variables. The pepperberry is like a weed. It, it doesn't even care if the, it gets any moisture. It was a, the, the, the stable crop that was used to make the beer made it so that yeah. the beer was always there. So 500 years of chicha beer is, is a solution to a longevity in the society. There you yeah, go. Sorry. Or science, 718 episodes in their yeah. hand. Yeah. 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 Blair, did you uh, did you delete your last story? I didn't have a last story. That's all I brought. Oh, I thought you had one in there. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it. That's all we wrote then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All we spoke. I would love to say thank you to you for listening to this show, for watching. Thank you to Fada for helping with social media and our show descriptions on YouTube. Thank you to Identity4 for recording the program so we can have a podcast. Thank you to Gord McLeod, Ben Rothig, others who assist in keeping our chat room a kind and compassionate space as we enjoy science together. And I would love to take this moment to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Andy Gross, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Aiden Jeff, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stefan Alboran, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Corinne Benton, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Bignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Leesman, Kirk Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Lucen. Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parajan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for your support on Patreon. If you are interested in finding out about Patreon, please visit twist.org where there are links. You can also help us out by telling your friends to subscribe to Twist. On next week's show, we will be back. Oh, wow. Is next week the merry, merry month of May already? Is that what's happening next week? Yes. Oh my. oh, my. Oh, May. We'll be hitting May full swing. We'll be back with more science Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. Pacific time. Find us at twist.org slash live. You can join the chat room. And you can also do that at our YouTube channel, youtube.com. Look for This Week in Science. And if you can't watch live, there are episodes archived for posterity. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a, one of the mobile type devices, and have we checked? I think I've said this. Uh, there may be Droid apps. Twist for Droid uh, probably doesn't work anymore in the Android marketplace. Uh, and just look for it. Just, you know what? Go to Apple, look for This Week in Science. You'll find us. For more information on anything you've heard here today, really to get to the bottom of that whole situation with the millipede legs, That's you will be that. able to find show notes on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners, maybe about your local climate story. Who knows? Ooh, yeah. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com. Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com. Or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. 
Just be sure to put twist T W I S somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at twist science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson flying at Blair's menagerie. We love your feedback. If there is a topic you'd like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Yes, but if you have learned anything from the show, please, please remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. Science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science, science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy, we're just trying to say the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy and this week in science is coming away so everybody listen to everything we say and if you use our methods instead of rolling a die we may rid the world of toxoplasma got the eye because it's this week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said then please just remember it's all in your head because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And now we are in the after show. Oh my goodness, there's a baby to announce. Hi everyone. Is it me? No, it's not oh. you, Minion Pamela, who has been with us for years and years and years, has a new baby. She's been pregnant for nine-ish months. <laughs> <laughs> Good and one. She, uh, she's she's uh, been listening from Australia for a very long time, and Ed from Connecticut has said that she had her baby, brand new little one. That's very exciting. Very exciting. Congratulations, Pam, and to your new daughter. Congratulations. That's wonderful. 
you're going to be in for the work. And yeah, she lo- I'm, I know Pam. Pam loves that stuff. But I don't know how Pam is like a never ending font of energy. She is. Very pipe. <sighs> how are you? Still tired? Yeah. Yeah. It was a long day. Sounds like a long day. Before the show, a bit. Sounds a little long. Just a little. Not too bad. Ba, ba, ba. Um, what else is going? Oh, my mic is quiet tonight. Darn it! I didn't oh, no. realize until the show was underway. I know. Got a yeah, it was turned down from last Friday. There we go. Hello. Uh uh-huh. Fudge buckets. Yeah. Also, what? the the swear was at 844, just so you know. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sad. Well, that's good identity for I have to cut things anyway because the show's too long. So hack, hack, cut, cut. It was a good show. It was a good show, but I have to cut off at least 15, 20 minutes, I think. I uh, I had a really uh, fascinating chat with somebody. Yeah. Uh, who studies hydras. Hydras. Oh, fun. Uh, I think we should have them on the show. They have a yeah. paper that may be getting published, and we might maybe try to time it for that. Um but I'll give you more more deets on that. But I did not know you gotta send how me the deets. amazing this creature is. Yeah, uh, it is. It is. It is amazing. And so we will talk about this on a future show. We'll have to. Oh, you gotta send me the deets. Yep, I will. Send me I, the actually, stuff. I did already. Uh, mm. Yeah, I sent you a text. The group, our group text. I, oh, I sent a that text, doesn't that doesn't count. Uh, with a link <laughs> to the lab, uh, and we went. Then that's when somehow we started the travel arrangement conversation. Came right after that. But uh, yeah. if you yeah. go back to the beginning of that thread in the text messages, there's a link to uh, the lab, and you'll see it's pretty amazing. You're making me do work to track this nope. down. Nope, I can I can send it again. <laughs> it's not hard. Um, no, I don't, I don't, it's so funny. I, I don't, I do a lot of stuff from my phone, but I have this weird, I like sitting at my computer and have, I'm like, it's an email and I can look at it in a big browser yeah. and then I can do things. Yeah. I can send my text yeah. to your email. That would be, <laughs> that, that would be perfect. My phone to your email. I'll make that perfect. Happen. That'll do. <laughs> Just put your I phone do. in an envelope. And send it. Yeah, just send me your phone. No. Yeah. <laughs> Hydras sound fun. Yeah. Um, there's a, a science writer, Andy Fell, who I know from years back, who works in the UC Davis uh, in public information office. And he messaged me. I think it was through Facebook or something. He messaged me and said, hey, is Justin in Davis? I've got some... Uh, some researcher I know has a, has somebody coming to visit, blah blah blah. For whatever reason, he was like, he's like, Can we, I'd love to introduce him to Justin. And yeah, so, so I, uh, was that where that came from? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was, still don't. And Andy didn't tell me anything about the lab or anything. I was just yeah. like, okay, there's Justin's email. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, so I had to, I had to look in, into the I had to look into this lab, and I looked okay. and I had to look, look into hydras, and uh, I cannot believe that this isn't something that Blair has brought every week. Because uh, Blair, this every is your week. wheelhouse. Completely. Yeah, but like, what's yeah, what's the what's the what happened this week? In hydras. No, no, it's not what happened this. You're right, down. but uh, well, there might be, but we, you need to be tracking this because uh, hydras are basically. We can. This will be the the interview later. Basically, they're made up of stem cells. 
They regenerate yeah. themselves every 20 days. And they yeah. estimate that they could possibly potentially live for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. So when they always say like, and oh, you, jellyfish are immortal. No, 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 no. It's the Hydra. It's the Hydra is the, the one. The yeah. Immortal thing on the planet. Yeah. And and you, I as I understand, uh, do have this desire to not yeah, die. Yeah, so. it's true. It's true. You're just going to have to rub Hydras all over your face. No, I'm just going to put my brain in a jar. It'll be that, fine. No, nah, that works. Uh, but yes, this is, I'll uh, be a human mm, crang. Mm. It's totes fine. This is uh, one of the... What, you know, every once in a while you cross on it, it's just I had no idea that this existed. Oh, yeah. I had no idea that this was a thing. I had no they idea. They were in my biology was... books in high school and college. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. We should... Uh, yeah. We have we 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 now have a contact with somebody who studies them and is uh, has a uh, paper somewhere in the status of maybe getting published. I don't know how cool. that works, uh, but we should uh, we should have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I kind of had it already, and I, I want to share with everybody because it was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. And they're so cute. I like it. They're also like one of the cutest. The cutest. Things they're I've cute. Seen. I don't know if I'd call them cute. They kind of just look oh, like yeah. water cactuses. No, 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 no. I got to see them like in person. They were, I had this little, they got to hold a little tube of them and they were waving at me with their little tentacles. But you know They're what's like funny? You look, you look for Hydra in Google Images and Hail like, Hydra. Oh, it's like dragon, Marvel, mythical, Hercules, constellation, yeah. Greek yeah. mythology, logo. I mean, I still haven't gotten there. We go. You have to go animal. Yeah. Hydra French animal. Water. Yeah. There's water. Water hydra, there you and even then, water it's like dragons and other yeah. things, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hydra animal, yeah, that's funny. There they are, they do kind of look well. Like the fresh to be water fair, ones looks like I the, why the, does I stop photo have so many first. pictures of hydra? <laughs> <All right. sighs> The mythical, it did come before your yeah. well, the the name for it. I mean, that's probably why these things are called Hydra with yeah. its multiple heads, but it's not heads. Yeah. And they're not that cute. I think they were adorable. Well, in person, they're adorable. I don't know what picture you're looking at. Oh, so, so cute. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello, teeny tiny squid looking things. So cute. My little squid looking thing, this little there, that guy with his oh. little tentacles. 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 I don't think I could eat ten tacos. And on that. No. Uh I'm uh-huh. gonna say goodnight, Justin. Great. Okay. Good night, Justin. Oh, Stay, wait. Before you do, night. hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I've got Blair's potential travel information. <gasps> Justin, I need oh. you traveling. I need to send an email okay. to the people. So, what do I got to uh, do? You need to figure out what uh, day yeah. and great time yeah. to leave Sacramento to go to Santa Fe. All right. Give me till Saturday. Okay. I need to. Uh, I know you need to call family. I, I that. totally blanked it. Um, I need to. Yeah, reach yeah. out. Yeah, reach out. Find out if they're around and abouts, and yep. uh, let me know what kind of flights you want. Okay. We'll do. Okay, I need that, and then I can make yep. things happen. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is it then. Okay. No more busyness. Go get sleep, everyone. And Say goodnight, I'm- Justin. Good night, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm sorry my volume was low. I did not realize it. I will see you on Friday at 1-ish p.m. Twitch.tv slash Dr. Kiki if you want to talk about science. And everyone else, we'll see you next Wednesday for more This Week in Science. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>